Hello, and welcome to another episode of A Podversation With. I'm Josh Palladini, bringing you this latest installment featuring my guest Patrick Holbert. Kids call him Whole Beans. This was a good one in depth, informative, illuminating, and all that good stuff. So let's get to it, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. kind of like a farm not on a farm I grew up in a rural area I lived in a town but surrounding the town was like horse farms and dairy farms and stuff like that uh, and my dad is a farm equipment mechanic uh, so yeah grew up in the country but like in a little neighborhood like a tiny town did you have any, like, uh, did you have, like, a lot of chores and stuff like that growing up? Or? Yeah, uh, well, actually, I guess we had chores. Um, my mother, like, pretty much did everything around the house. Uh, she, uh, she did all the cleaning, and we, tr- like, she really wanted us to pitch in, but it was rare, it was rare that we did, uh, so... I don't know. I guess there were there were times when we when I had chores, and then other times where we let her do everything, uh, which I actually feel really bad about. Uh, if I could do it over again, I think I'd pitch in more. Um, at what point did you said that you went to uh, to college to be on TV? Yeah. When when did that desire first like manifest? I guess in high school or, I don't know, I guess I I uh I wanted to become an entertainer or a comedian uh probably in a in like a you know, in a conscious sense, probably in high school. I uh I I was on my morning announcement TV show. We had like a camcorder plugged into the wall. And uh, I was like, oh, there's a way to get a whole bunch of attention. Uh, So I joined, it was called WSBC. uh, And it was the morning broadcast. And uh, yeah, like on there we do different skits sometimes. um, Try to slip in a joke here or there. I remember uh, Sean Hansen, who was like, the very technical person um, on the on the on the staff, he wrote this joke. He was like, "Hey, you should say on air that the uh, the procrastination club meeting has been postponed." Uh, and I remember thinking, "God, that is such a funny joke." And yeah, let's do it. And I remember saying it, and uh, you know, getting a chuckle from our supervisor, but then also like, "Don't ever do that again," <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, and, and the supervisor was an English teacher, and she said to me, like, you know, like, you could go to school for this. I know you want to go to art school, but you should think about going to school to, like, make TV. And uh, I started thinking, well, I'll go to school and just do this at college. I'll go be on TV, which is what I did. Uh, but then, yeah, uh, I, I got good at making TV, and... Uh, uh, yeah, I graduated and just got sucked into the industry, and um, here I am, uh, 11 years later, trying to uh, get from behind the camera back in front. <laughs> Did you feel like um, that you were starved for attention when you were younger? Like, did you feel neglected, or? I never felt neglected. Uh, I think, like... Yeah, like, this is, like, interesting stuff because my parents did the, you know, they were, they were, did the best they could, you know. Uh, my, my dad wasn't around a whole lot. 
and they got separated when I was in eighth grade. Uh, and there were three of us, and you know, if you get Aunt Nat drunk enough and she starts telling stories, uh, it kind of it, it's kind of come out at parties that like maybe most of us weren't expected. <laughs> Uh, which is fine, you know, like that happens all the time. And I did, I remember doing the math and th thinking, like, wow, like my dad was 23 when my brother came along. Uh, or no, not 23, 20, I don't know, 25, 20, whatever it was. Uh, which is, yeah, like 25, which is crazy to me now. Like, when I was 25, I was a mess. And, uh, so I think, like, you know, they weren't they weren't babies having babies. It wasn't like that. Uh, but it was like they were probably unprepared to be parents. And like, you know, my mom, uh, like I said, essentially did everything. Like she uh, she worked full time, and and uh, we were latchkey kids. And um, there were always like we weren't poor. Uh, I, I would say we were broke. You know, like I do, like money was always a topic, you know, it was always a thing that created tension, you know, um, and I think, uh, I think like the attention stuff, like we, we got the kind of attention they could provide, you know, but, uh, perhaps I, I wanted more or a different kind of attention or, um, you know, looking back, like I don't, I don't know that they like, uh, really could figure out the best way to, to, uh, encourage us, like, I think we, w the three of us, I think, just kind of figured it out on our own, like, my brother was really into sports, my sister's really into music, um, I'm the middle of the three, and I, uh, I was more into, like, the, we the, the outside of school stuff, like, skateboarding, and rollerblading, and, you know, being one of the little rascals in my group of friends, and, uh, I don't know, I always liked adventure and things like that, so, I don't know, I guess, I don't know, I'm doing a terrible job of answering this question, but, uh, I think, like, I think, yeah, I always wanted to be, like, special or noticed or, um, legendary, <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> So you felt like you had something inside of you that yeah. set you apart, or yeah, I think I think so. Like I, I always thought I was funny. Uh, I, I don't know. I liked I liked the the feeling of like people telling stories about me. Like I got into this phase in high school. We we're actually just reminiscing about this at a family party, like at my sister's. 16 year old birthday like I just like came out like without a shirt on and like did this crazy dance and then at my 18th birthday I did another nude related dance where I was like putting ice cream on my ch bare chest and like goading my friends to like get some and uh, I just like creating a scene you know uh, and I think like we, we grew up that is one thing I'll say about my siblings and I and, and some cousins I have. We grew up really into stand-up and comedy, and, like, we watched tons of comedy. On, like, I remember when Comedy Central first started, and as a kid, just, like, they, they didn't have real shows at first. It was just, like, a lot of montage clips of stand-up comedians. And uh, we just watched a ton of that stuff, and we loved it. And I think I got really into, like wanting to create those kinds of moments, but not knowing I wanted to do it in the form of comedy, just like, I don't know, just like these weird performance cry, cries for attention, you know? Uh, but it was about entertaining people also. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I loved, you know, I loved making people laugh. I did it in a really shitty way when I was younger, like, I discovered I was funny in late elementary school, like, I didn't speak until fourth grade, and then, uh, when I did start talking, I discovered I could make my friends laugh if I made fun of other people, so I actually had, like, a fifth and sixth grade, I was, like, a bully, you know, like, I was mean, 
I would say, really mean things to other people and construct these really elaborate mean pranks to entertain my friends. Like, I remember this one girl who, uh, I, I think she had, I, I think she had disability type issues and I, I remember convincing her that we were a couple only to like a couple days later like in this very mean spirited way like break up with her and like have a good laugh with my friends about how you know oh we I really got her you know and like it's so fucked up that that's how it came out at first um and this other girl, I remember our sixth grade moving up day, I, uh, this one girl was wearing, like, this really cute, like, cocktail dress, and, and, like, she had heeled shoes on, and it was very provocative for, a for that age kid, and one of my friends dared me to ask her, uh, how much she cost, uh, and I did it, and she didn't get it, and she asked the teacher what it meant, and, it was very upsetting for the girl. I think for her, I think her mother was eventually involved. The teacher was like, you can't say stuff like that to people. We might not let you move, you know, graduate today. Like it was, it was one of those like shameful moments of like, man, like words can really hurt people. And like, and I, you know, that's a, that's a thing that happened a lot for me through over the years is like just saying too much and, and crossing the line, you know. Uh, so yeah. So you were, like many comedians, uh, you were weaned on short attention span theater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is that was that show. Marin hosted that, right? Yeah. 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 A Whitney yeah. Brown too. Uh, they had a couple different hosts, but it was mostly Marin's show. Yeah. Do you um? Was there any one particular stand up from that? from that time that, that stood out like related to you or yeah and, and this I was thinking about this today because I knew I'd be coming here uh, I remember Comedy Central had two or three different Andy Kaufman specials that they would play and I remember watching those over and over again and being like amazed by this guy and uh, and Tom Green was just coming out back then and I remember like stealing those bits and like coming to going to school and like just using like talking to friends in those voices and in those uh, like the different routines uh, and just being like like loving the idea of like uh, you could be totally weird and not necessarily be telling jokes but still get laughs um, so guess I was really into the silly stuff at first, which isn't really what I'm about now, uh, but I'm also new to comedy, basically, so I kind of wonder if I'll ever venture back toward, like, the really absurd stuff. Uh, but yeah, like, I, our senior trip in high school, I remember, like, doing really weird stuff f for my friend's benefit, you know, like, chatting up strangers at the airport or, you know, causing a scene in the swimming pool and, like, I remember, like, mounting this goofy statue in the swimming pool at the hotel and, like, taking these pictures of where it looks like Goofy and I are, like, getting it on uh, and just, like, laughing our asses off, you know, and, like, feeling like, yeah, this is, like, I don't know. It, it, I'm uncomfortable saying it, but, like, I feel like I... If I can get better at stand-up, I feel like I am made for it, you know? Like, like creating those fun kind of silly moments where, like, we can all just have a good time in the same place, you know? Uh, That's interesting. Um, you said you did a little stand-up in college? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, summer of 2000, I was... I stayed at school. Like, when I left home, I, I, uh, like, I love where I'm from. I love my family. But I, like, did not want to be physically back in the house I grew up in. So I just, like, went to college and then never really, I came back for visits, but I stayed every summer to do a different internship or whatever I did. And that first summer I was interning in the city 
for VH1 and Times Square, and uh, there was a place called Hamburger Harry's that had a sign in the window that said open mics on Mondays, I think, and, uh, you know, I'd known, I remember the summer before I went to college, I got a composition notebook, and I started writing what I thought would be good jokes, um, because I was like, I'm going to do stand-up, like, I would, I, I, Talk to my, I remember talking to my mom about it Like I'm going to go to college Maybe I'll get a job as a bartender somehow And then I'll try comedy And I remember her saying like Yeah you'll get good experiences doing that um, So anyway I had it in my head Like when I left my hometown Like I'm going to go to college And eventually I'm going to do stand up And it, it took a year or whatever and, and that summer I discovered Hamburger Harry's and I went to one of those on July 20th, 2000. I just discovered a journal where I wrote down that's what I did that day. And, uh, yeah, I went to the open mic, and it did not go well. Uh, I was not funny in that performance. And I think I went there two or three times. Maybe even only one, once or twice. De definitely twice, maybe three. I don't know. Uh, but Gladys Simon hosted it, and now I see her name popping up all over the place. I'm like, oh my god, like, what a cool thing that she's still around. And, and I remember being there and, like, hearing people say things like, oh, Jim Gaffigan started here, and now you hear people talk about hamburger hair. I guess Zach Galifianakis was on that scene. And So anyway, I did, like, yeah, like I said, like two or three times there, and then in back on campus, uh, there was a black sorority that would do an open mic night, and I, uh, I did, com I tried comedy there a couple times, and they thought I was hilarious, because I was just this, like, gangly white dude who would, uh, quote rap lyrics, and, uh, black people love that, uh, unfortunately, I can't still get away with being that simple, uh, so it was weird, what happened was I thought, wow, I'm like really funny amongst people I'm comfortable with, but then at Hamburger Harry's it's like, not good, uh, this is all too difficult, like maybe I'll just write silly songs and try to be funny that way. And uh, I did some shows where I played a guitar and sang what I thought were funny songs, looking back now they're not very funny. Uh, and that was like sort of like the easier option. Uh, so yeah, stand up didn't stick in college because basically I realized that this is going to be too hard. Like, how can I just be instantly gratified? Uh, and also, I I discovered drinking. Um, I discovered drinking and partying, and that mixed with how hard it is to do stand up led to me just like starting a band and uh, partying for four years, uh, which was good, you know, I was on stage a lot, and we were, you know, we were a, like a punk band, it was like poppy punk stuff, and uh, a lot of our, you know, we, my favorite song, Listening Back, is, uh, is, about, is about our favorite Chinese delivery restaurant. Uh, so it was all silly, fun stuff, and it was I, I felt like I was exercising the humor muscles, um, but it was like easier, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, were you, the, you were the lead singer. I was <coughs> one of them. There were two of us that <coughs> sang. We also rapped uh, when I formed when we formed the band. I really wanted us to be like uh, Beastie Boys, uh, License to Ill, Volume Two. Uh, and we had some songs that felt a lot like that, and then we just, we had very talented musicians in the band, and I think those guys were more interested in playing uh, good music, and not just like lifted riffs and, you know, big beats. Uh, so, yeah, I was, yeah, I, uh, yeah, so between the band and then like TV shows I was making, I was like... Like, how can I perform for people as often as possible, but not have to work hard mm -hmm. at it, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Um, you listen to hip-hop from an early age? Yeah. Uh, 
I grew up in a town. I actually are my one of my first music mentors is this guy Kevin Van Amberg, and uh, he introduced my brother and I to Metallica and like a lot of heavy rock and heavy metal. Uh, Stu Munson was a classmate of mine that got me into ACDC at like third grade. I remember getting uh, uh, Thunderstruck from him, and. Uh, so I was really into that stuff in like elementary school, and as great as insane as it is, our mother bought us Beastie Boys' "License to Ill" on cassette, and I remember listening to that and like having this feeling of like, wait, this is totally different, uh, and it was like kind of not cool to like rap music in my town, um, amongst that circle of friends. Uh, so I was, yeah, we were exposed to it, but I didn't think it was that cool until I was in high school, really. Um, and then I got really into hip-hop, uh, especially in college. Um, and then, like, after college. And, and again, actually, you know what it is? I, I have a feeling it's like, well, it's way easier to write a rap song and perform rap music because you don't have to sing in tune. Uh, I don't have to make, like, complicated music. And I can tell jokes in my lyrics. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I ended up rapping. Uh, but yeah, a lot, like, hip-hop is was the soundtrack to my high school experience. You know, like, all the early Beastie Boys CDs, I, like, learned word for word. I loved going to parties and just, like, uh, you know, acapella rapping those songs with my buddy Josh. Uh, uh, Tribe Called Quest, you know, loved their the, those CDs. Just driving around, like listening to to that kind of stuff. KRS One was like uh, House of Pain, like the the non hit House of Pain records. I got really into. Uh, yeah, as it ever was, and uh, yeah, I forget the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> you started having success, right, as a rapper? Not success. Uh, I played a lot of parties and shows. Yeah, like uh, my buddy and I, who was the drummer in Red Eleven, the college band, he started playing drums for me when I became Pat Miscellaneous. That okay. was my rap name. I was going to ask. Uh, and that was, that was like 2004. And the band, we, uh, everybody like got real jobs and were living in different parts of the area and it was hard to get together as a band, so uh, Alan and I decided to play it together. Uh, and yeah, uh, I would never, I don't think success is a good word, but we, we played a lot. Like, we played a lot of shows, had a lot of good times. We definitely, like, he's an, he's an amazing drummer and musician in general. Um, so, like, that led to more like creative beats and uh but it, it actually it all sort of like became this vehicle for for my drinking like I was I was basically a cartoon character on stage you know it was like this whole character like we would dress one show we dressed up as Elvis both of us another show like we were pimps like in pimp garb uh, another time it was like all nerdy like wardrobe stuff and it was all about like not being real you know it wasn't like real hip hop you know like I don't think anybody from that world would ever see us and be like man those guys are really real you know it was like a again it was like more performance art than anything and uh and it act it, yeah I think it became like more about like let's throw parties and play shows so we can get real wasted and, you know, party. Um, which, for me, became a, a problem. So, it, it uh, I don't know, it's interesting to, I don't know, kind of see how it all, it's, it's, it's snowballed, you know. Um, so, um, so what made you, like, put the brakes on the whole thing? Well, I had to quit drinking, and we did keep playing 
Pat Miscellaneous. Uh, I think we only played like two more shows after I quit drinking. Um, that was like six years ago exactly now. So, you know, I think uh, I was at this, at the same time my career was going really well. Like I was getting bigger and bigger projects to work on. And I think when I, I quit drinking to save a relationship and like between this big job I got, uh, trying to figure out how to not go crazy while not drinking and uh, keep a keep the relationship together like there was just no way I could keep being in a band either um, so it was never like a conversation we had we were never like you know what the band's over it's just like we we didn't book more stuff um, and I I guess I, I kept writing, I tried to write some songs. Actually, you know what, the first year, the first six months actually of being dry uh, were miserable, you know, like I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't really be creative, I didn't feel creative. And I guess all that juice was kind of going toward my work. Um, so I was just like, I don't know, like, so... Uh, so like, I don't know, what's, what's it, what's the word when you're just like, it's almost obsessing about making shit work out, like, I was just like white knuckling everything, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was like, the fun stuff was like, became less and less of a priority, uh, yeah, it's a weird, that was a weird time. So it took you a while to get back to where you had been in terms of, of wanting to be a stand-up and, and trying to follow that the performer yeah. side. Well, when I got sober, I I, uh, I like started like, well, I went to therapy and then I, I joined a group to help stay sober and the message I kept getting the way I was interpreting the way you do all this stuff is like, you, like the, the, this word humility gets thrown around a lot. Like, you know, you've got to find a way to be humble and just appreciate the things you have. And, uh, you know, it's almost like, like the message, I, the way I received it was like, don't want for more than you deserve. Like, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're lucky that uh, you have whatever you have. So... Um, not that anybody was saying any of those things, but that's how I started thinking. Like, man, I am lucky. Like, I have this great job. Uh, I, you know, this the relationship didn't work out, but I started telling myself, like, why do I even want to be a rapper? Like, why? Like, like that was clearly about like let's party, let's get attention, let's whatever, which is not healthy. So I think I, I went into the zone of like, all right, I'm just going to be a documentary filmmaker. And I say that with major air quotes because I was making documentary TV shows for uh, one of those channels that, um, I don't know, some of the stuff I'm, I made I'm really proud of. But anyway, whole other story. But uh, I, so those first few years of being sober, I was like more obsessed with like being a responsible adult. I was like, well, what's what's a responsible adult do? And a responsible adult um, just does their job, does the job they were hired for, and uh, doesn't expect more than they deserve, you know? So I, I kind of went to this place of, like, I don't deserve to, like, be a rapper or entertainer or any of that stuff, you know? Like, I should just be what I am doing now, and I should do my best at it. So I did that until two years ago. I, uh, I had uh, a group of friends. We decided to do this workshop, this creativity workshop called the Artist Way. And uh, basically, it's a it's a workshop where you like do all these writing exercises and uh, you try to figure out like what uh, 
if you feel creatively blocked, like, what's in your way? You know, like, how to unblock all that. So I did that workshop, and all signs pointed to, uh, you wanted to do comedy since you were a kid, like, get back to it, you know? Uh, and then I, right after doing that, I read this book called The Alchemist, which I recommend to everyone, and that's the same message. Like, we're, you know, you're born with, like, the goals you want in your life, you're born with, they're in your DNA, so, like, go do them. Uh, so that's when I started really, like, peeling the layers of, like, uh, everything in my life and realized, like, yeah, I want to do stand-up comedy and I should go try again. So I did. So two years ago I tried. I got up seven times over the course of six weeks, I think. It was, like, December 2012 and January 2013 think those are the dates maybe maybe I mean 2011 and 2012 whatever it was it was like a year and a half ago uh, two years ago ish uh, and I it did not go well uh, but I was only going like once a week so the stakes were so high you know mm -hmm. I didn't realize like oh, shit that didn't go well well I got another one I can go do you know it was more like man that was terrible I hate myself I'm not going to do this again for another week when I have better material written, you know. Uh, so I basically intimidated myself out of it. Uh, so yeah, it was... A, I, I, I basically feel like I got... like When I stopped trying in college, I probably just got distracted by the idea of like, just do something easier, mm -hmm. you know. And then... Uh, and then, yeah, the my drinking problem really threw me for a bigger loop than I think I even realized at the time. Like, it's now having the, the, the time and more and more clarity each day to be able to look back and see, like, yeah, that, that really took me off course, you know? Um, at the point where you felt like you didn't deserve... Uh, to be basically what you wanted to be. Do you know, do you remember why you felt that way? Uh, I hear this coming out of my mouth a lot and I'm starting to think it's not true. <laughs> but, uh, in the town I come from and the family I come from, uh, you don't, you, you just, you like work your job, uh, you work hard, like hard work is like a big value that people have, it's like a virtue, um, you know, I remember, I remember like a piece of rhetoric that I would hear a lot before college, it was like, go to school, get a good job with benefits, uh, whether that job has any actual benefits, like, just find a career, like get a career, um, because there, were, my generation and my family is just pretty much the first group that like actually went to college and stuff like that and something I hear myself saying is like well you know the family I come from like you don't you're not supposed to want anything special for yourself and I think I think I might be not be giving my family enough credit because I actually I just had this realization this weekend I spent a lot of time with them and like like this is new like I just started back doing stand-up on March 5th of 2014 and it's just barely six months ago now, whatever whatever it is, and uh, yeah, I guess it's six months in a few days, and uh, it's it's funny like telling the different groups of people in your life like yeah I do stand up comedy, and uh, and like some people are like oh really like that's interesting like you know you get, like I, I, one person an acquaintance like not someone I know well at all she's like oh you you're funny. Uh, like, you get those reactions, and then, you know, there's the whole ski, uh, spectrum of the, the reactions, and some people are confused, some people are like, okay, that's weird, like, I think a lot of, some coworkers, I have a lot of really supportive coworkers, but some coworkers are probably like, man, what is that guy doing? Like, we give him so many opportunities, why would he, like, sort of turn his back on his career to go do this thing? Anyway, and with my family, 
I'm realizing uh, their reaction is like, of course you are. Of course you're doing stand-up comedy. Like, none of them have said it in those words, but like, like they've known my whole life that I was the clown at the family parties when I was a kid. And, you know, there's pictures of me with like, walnuts up my nose next to my aunts like having a laugh at Thanksgiving and like like all my aunts and uncles like they know that I like to joke around and uh, I I just had this realization that like yeah they this is not a surprise for them like they're excited for me and I like to tell myself this story of like I'm the black sheep of the family and they don't understand me and you know they'll never they'll never understand why I do why I want to do comedy, uh, but that's it's bullshit. Like I think those are the people in my life that know exactly why I want to do it. Maybe not why I want to do it, but just the fact that I it's what I want to do. Um, so I guess as for like why I like because it is still an issue of like why do I think I deserve to be successful at this, um, I think that's just self-esteem related, you know, like, like, why, why, why do I think I'm special, like, why do I think I'm entitled to other people's attention, Mm -hmm. or praise, or whatever, uh, yeah, I don't know, (coughs) excuse me, um, how long did you go between, um, stage time between performing and in, in, in college and doing the, uh, the workshop thing yeah so that was in the fall did the workshop which was basically a book club uh, with my friends uh, that was we started doing that in August like exactly two years ago so August 2012 uh, and my last Pat Miscellaneous rap performance was October 2008, oh. I believe. So probably four years. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Don't quite know where I'm going to go next. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned humility because you are a very humble guy uh, despite the fact that <clears throat> you are uh, let, let me just let's just say handsome <laughs> uh, and I know you get told that a lot um, is that something that you struggle with of of keeping your ego in such a place where you feel like you deserve to be on stage and you deserve the attention but not wanting to get out of control like maybe you did mm. yeah I you know like I uh, I do I do feel myself sometimes thinking like well I don't have to work as hard because you know maybe I'll just get a job as a TV host or something and like I don't have to be that funny to do that you know and then I can really work on being funny when I have the luxury of like working on something a couple days a week uh, you know get paid good money to be on TV and then and then I can get funny Uh, so yeah like this like yeah maybe I can just fall back on uh, first of all thank you well not first of all (laughs) let me bullshit for a second and then (laughs) Acknowledge the fact that that's a very kind thing to say, and I appreciate it. Uh, And, yeah, I don't know. Like, I also... I also am aware of the theme of, like, you know, stand-up isn't isn't for uh, (laughs) handsome people. Uh, Which I don't really resent, because I understand understand that. Um, Because I also am aware of the idea of, like, you know, you hear Marin say it all the time, like, well, there's nothing else I could do, you know, there's, what else am I going to do with my, you know, this is what I was born to do, and the truth is, like, I, I, I was a pretty successful TV producer, and I could, I could do that for the rest of my life, and, uh, could I do it and be happy? No, like, if I woke up 10 years from now having the same regrets I had about not doing this 
this art form that I wanted to do my whole life sooner, uh, I, I could see how people, you know, walk off a building, you know. Uh, it was, I was in a rough place uh, at the beginning of this year, and um, so yeah, like, I, don't, I know those aren't all connected ideas, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't think too much about my looks, honestly, because I I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of self esteem issues in the in in the physicality department too, you know. Um, which I I remember Mick Andrews uh, calling me out on uh, some stuff I was working on about like because I'm a, I'm addicted to sweets, like I have a bad uh, desserts um, thing and. Uh, I was making some jokes about that, and uh, and he called me out on it, and uh, I, d I, w I realized, like, oh yeah, I don't think I can really tell jokes about my diet or uh, how I look shirtless in front of an audience, you know, with, with and get someone to believe it, you know? Uh, so I understand, I don't know, I, un I understand all that, I think, I don't know. But thanks for the flattery. I'll take no, uh, I'll take flattery any day over sincere, honest truth. Uh, do you ever? Um, so you do you ever feel like that that the way that you look gets in the way of your ability to connect with an audience? No, I, I mean I guess in that one respect, maybe like if I went up and I was talking about how I can't stop eating snacks and my belly is getting out of control like if I'm an audience member and I see somebody talk about that I would probably think well go fuck yourself because you're a handsome white guy and you can you know <laughs> you're doing just fine you know uh, I think it's an asset honestly like I I'm a pretty non-threatening looking person and uh, you know it is a it's a it's a superficial art form, you know, like, you're asking an audience to look at one person for, you know, several minutes at a stretch, and, uh, you know, hopefully someday a half an hour or an hour at a time, uh, so I feel like it makes my life easier, probably, you know? Uh... I do want to point out that I'm, I'm hesitant to even cop to uh, being handsome or, or have a nice appearance, but uh, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm trying to answer these <laughs> without sounding like a douchebag. <clears throat> so, at one point you thought you were gonna be a documentarian, a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I also noticed that you you put um, Bowling for Columbine amongst your favorite films. Yeah. Was was that the kind of were, were you going to to handle all sorts of things, or were you looking at bigger issues that you wanted to to tackle in films? Or yeah, I don't I don't know exactly about what I want to make, uh, but I put that on there. So I put Bowling for Columbine on my pre-interview. Uh, as one of my favorite movies because that seeing that movie was a turning point for me. I was uh, a junior in college and uh, again, like realizing that I was forming this split not split personality, but this duality of like in one hand I wanted I was this like camera hog like wannabe comedian. and on the other hand, I was this very capable uh, camera operator, editor, um, producer, uh, studio manager, like, I was a, I, I had done tons of internships, and, uh, and I also saw the TV industry as my ticket out of, like, my hometown, like, if I could get a job, then I could, uh, not have to move back to where I'm from, uh, so I remember seeing that movie and thinking, oh my god, that was funny, uh, 
he's speaking truth to power. Uh, he's covering this really important issue. Um, like, maybe I don't need to be in front of the camera. Like, maybe I can make films that are actually important and, and could change the world, you know? Because uh, I think that movie definitely raised consciousness levels uh, and sparked some activism. And so anyway, that that movie, uh, maybe it was a blessing to see it, but maybe it was also a curse. Like, because that's when I started giving my per myself permission to say, like, well, I'll just I'll just go make documentary films, you know. Um, maybe I maybe at that point in time I should have been watching more Andy Kaufman documentaries so that I could be reminded that I wanted to perform, you know. Because even when I was the camera hog wannabe comedian, it was always with this, like, thing in the back of my mind of, like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be trying to get so much attention, you know? Because, like, trying to get attention is, like, a thing I remember hearing, like, growing up, like, oh, he's just trying to get attention, you know? Uh, he's just looking for attention. And that's, uh, and I still hear, hear that, you know? Uh, not about me, but like hear other family members say that about other people, you know, whatever. And uh, so I guess I just never felt comfortable like saying like I would like to be a performer, you know. Mm -hmm. It's taken me until now to say that without feeling shy about it. Did you feel like there had to be some purpose behind it, or yeah, or just that it's not it's it's for other people, like mm -hmm. other people do that. Um, are any of those um, are any of those ideals um, raising consciousness, inspiring debate? Are those still uh, things that you'd like to eventually tackle in your material? I would. I really would. Uh, I I really. I'm trying to write about like environmentalism type stuff like like littering is something that really bothers me uh, and I I think I have some funny ideas around it but it's so hard to, for me to write funny jokes about things that aren't like uh, you know like I feel like most of my jokes are about my relationship and you know, sex issues in the relationship or whatever, and it's stuff that's like already got built in tension, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, now I'm like, man, I would really like to write stuff uh, that's is just super funny, but not necessarily controversial. Well, yeah, maybe controversial. Like, yeah, I, I would. I really would like to tackle bigger issues. Uh, you know, politics. I mean, we the, the world is crazy right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just I don't have I don't have the words for stuff. You know, like I'm not I'm not super informed. Like I don't go out of my way to like learn about different political parties and conflicts and you know international issues, all that stuff. I and I'm ashamed to say that because. Uh, I do think part of the job description is to uh, is to know what's going on in the world and have an interesting take on it, you know. But I, uh, again, that's like so much hard work that I'm like, I just want to get laughs, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get laughs and not have to work for them, which is uh, insane. Um. Talk about improv a little bit. Yeah. Um, was it just another way? Uh, was you, you going to use uh, UCB and mm -hmm. stuff? Was that just another way for you to exercise your comedy muscle, or were you looking for a different kind of experience? Yeah. So that's that's a good question, and like, uh, it, it was a big turning point because. So two years ago, I went up seven times, didn't go well, and then I took on this big job. Uh, I took on this big project, 
and that it didn't go well like I, I uh, it got uh, I basically got like my ass handed to me by the universe uh, in, in my career um, long story short like I was producing this project and it failed and a lot of money was lost and then like to patch it all up I got assigned this other project that became very like uh, um, personally challenging uh, and uh, and I fi when that finally got done a year and a half had passed or like over a year had passed since the last time I was on stage uh, and I just felt guilty about it I was like man like I just got sucked into this whole whirlwind and I haven't tried stand up I haven't written I haven't you know like so I decided that when that project was done finally I was like I'm, I gotta do something and I I just thought why don't I just do an improv class like why don't I just do something to like see what happens and I remember within 20 minutes of being in the very first class this was in February. I uh, I knew I was like I'm here because this is going to bring me back to stand up. And I met Julian Guarino. Uh, he was my classmate in my UCB 101. Oh wow! And he's a stand up, and he mentioned that in in class. And within a month, he took me to an open mic, and uh, which didn't go well. But I I kind of started picking up that these guys were all doing this every day, you know. Uh, I really like improv It's not what stand up is for me Like stand up I, I feel really connected to Improv I'm sort of like I'm learning a lot about comedy From very smart people Who love to laugh uh, I don't know I don't think I'm a, a great improviser By any stretch But uh, it's been a really cool experience um, And I wouldn't be doing stand up If I didn't Again, if I didn't take that class, I did a 101 and a 201, and now I, I'm on a team. Uh, so it's it's going well. Uh, it's it's all like definitely a part of the same snowball. That's cool. Yeah. Um, you don't mind if we talk about the uh, you taking classes with Jeff? No. Do you? No. So <coughs> you took the six week course mm -hmm. that's the first that's the first stand-up class that you ever took was with was that yeah I did that and then right after I did one with Jessica Kearson also and I'm not shy to talk about it because uh, the same way I needed those improv classes and the same way I go to certain open mics uh, I need love and support and warmth and uh, uh, some coddling and some flattery <laughs> Uh, I do need criticism as well, of course. Uh, but I need—I also need structure. You know, uh, I'll probably sign up for another class soon. I'm thinking about doing a storytelling class or something, because I, if I if I try to do this on my own, like I have a feeling it's just going to lead to like less and less open mics, and like you know, finding some way to like take the easy route again. You know. And classes just it's like an accountability thing mm -hmm. um, and there's some things there are there are tricks that you can use with stuff and I needed I wanted to learn them you know uh, it seems like um, the one common thing um, amongst Jeff's students is that they very quickly get out of the thing of hiding behind jokes, mm. which most comics do usually for about the first year or two years, you know, where they're, where they're afraid to get personal or they don't know how to make personal stories funny. Or Is that a thing that Jeff consciously focused on? or Yeah, definitely. Like, early on it was like, talk about you. Like, what's going on with you? I remember him saying... Uh, I'm trying to think of what the joke was Oh like I have this silly joke about my girlfriend Like we're both tall and lanky So we don't spoon we spatula yeah. And like 
it's a cute joke. And he said that. He's like, that's a cute joke. And you, you seem like a good joke writer, but, like, what's really going on in your relationship? You know, like, what's, what's, where are you at really with her? Uh, and I remember hearing that and being, like, excited about, like, oh, so, yeah, I guess I should get personal. Uh, but also, like, freaked out by, like, that that's so important. But, but like, the point, from what I gather, is that uh, it's way easier to connect with your audience when, um, if I allow myself to be vulnerable, you know? And, uh, yeah, that was, like, a big thing in this class, for sure. And same with Jessica. Um, so now I, I, I kind of feel like I don't have enough jokes, like... Because I'd like to have things that are just sort of standalone, universal jokes that would be funny if anyone told them, you know. Uh, and that is such a craft that I appreciate and love so much, but I haven't figured it out for myself yet. Um, let's go into your writing process a little bit. Um, yeah, how do you how do you write, basically? Well, I, I journal every day. Uh, been slipping lately. You, right now, I think I average four out of seven days. I sit for about a half an hour in the morning and journal. And that comes from the artist way. Uh, the artist way workshop, you, you're, one of the first things she tells you is like, just write every single day in the morning. They're your morning pages. And uh, I use the morning pages to spitball ideas, like just write about things long form, sometimes pray prayers, uh, sometimes like pet peeves or like uh, resentments I have, I'll write in my morning pages. Um, but just write, writing and sort of trying to turn the, my mind off and just like, just write stream of consciously, consciousnessly. Um, and sometimes I'll stumble on funny ideas that way and then I'll just kind of like talk around those ideas at open mics some or in conversations with people. Uh, and then when I feel like I'm getting laughs around a certain theme, I'll just kind of like go on a Word document and try to write like specific punchlines to things. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a good, well, sort of a good flow. I don't know. I, I like. I think like writing for Twitter is a good idea. That worked for me for a couple jokes, um, but I haven't found a real consistent flow with that I haven't found a consistent flow with my writing at all actually I those are all things I do but it's still not like a system mm -hmm. and I like systems mm -hmm. but I can't seem to get one going for writing because uh, you know right now especially I feel like I'm back at square one uh, trying to write new stuff A lot of listing, like I like listing things, you know, mind maps, but even that, it's like, it's hard to get from just like scribbling down random words and ideas to formed out jokes, you know? <clears throat> um, it's interesting because you mentioned feeling guilty about not having gone on stage. Um, do you feel that uh, you must on some level let's just say feel that you've been blessed to be a creative and, and able to make people laugh yeah definitely man uh, I feel really really lucky like as a, a lot of the stuff I've bitched about in the past like oh like you know, my, you know, my parents didn't do this or that, or, or I, you know, I got drunk for nine years, like, if that didn't happen, I'd be 
further ahead or all that stuff I, I've actually decided were all blessings because it all just now falls into the category of research you know like whatever got me to where I am sitting right now in this moment like were all experiences that I needed to have to be here right now um, and I feel lucky for that and I do feel lucky for my personality really like I remember I remember when I quit drinking I had I was like a month into it and I was talking to my dad on the phone and uh, he said he, I remember him recognizing this thing about me that I, I don't give him enough credit for recognizing or saying but he said you know you'll be all right because uh, you know you never were the kind of guy that needed to drink to have fun like you always knew you, you always got along with people really easy and and he, he said like you know that's hard for me uh, and so yeah I, I do feel lucky that because that was actually a big point of pride I didn't start drinking until I was in college and that was a big point of pride for me was that I was like I was invited to all the cool parties in high school and I was one of the popular kids and I was uh, you know somebody people wanted to hang out with even though I wasn't like drinking or doing drugs or whatever um, so yeah I think I was certainly blessed or you know whatever but you feel do you feel you feel a responsibility to the universe to pay back what you've been given yeah yeah like I do think uh, I don't often think of it that way but like yeah totally like it's a shame anytime you know I see in somebody like I've got a friend who's a great writer and I know he, he has this gift but he's like caught up in other stuff that sort of prevents him from getting it out there and uh, yeah I think I think it is like a duty we all have you know and the alchemist touches on that uh, that it, you know we're because we're just like channels you know like uh, I do think it's like any art is like just communicating like some kind of energy or spirit or love or whatever you know if, if you make art it's like you're doing a service for God or the universe or whatever, whoever or whatever you, you think of it as. Wow. <clears throat> We're at an hour and there's like still so much I want to, <laughs> there's still so much I want to talk to you about. Well, the listeners are napping right now, so it's, uh, Let's, um, cause there are, you know, there's a couple things that, that I do want to touch on, um, cause it's important, I think for other this, this is as much for uh, for people who want to be comedians, you know, and people that are comedians that um, I think it's important uh, that just for a sec, can you just talk about being sober in comedy and uh, what maybe is, is still difficult about it, maybe if there's something that you are surprised is not a, as hard, if you could just talk about just for a little bit, just about about that whole that experience. Uh, well, I have to say that it it does take a lot of work to stay sober, um, and I get a lot of help from friends and from like other people who are also trying to stay sober. Uh, you know, in a formatted group environment, and that's that. For, you know, I've, I just celebrated six years sober last weekend, and uh, that wouldn't have happened without being a part of that whole th part of that community. Mm -hmm. um, and for the first four and a half, five years of my sobriety, that's like how I stayed sober: was that I was really engaged in this community. Um, and now that I've discovered comedy, not discovered it, but like finally engaged in it and uh, feel like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be, I'm now, like, in this new community where this is where I want to spend my time. You know, like, I've found my tribe, like you and Judith and Justin and the Caitlins and, you know, Gene and Greg and all, all those people, all those, you know, 
I don't want to list all my favorite comics, but people that are very warm and supportive and like the people I meet at open mics uh, specifically to see them and that kind of thing. Uh, it it's sort of it's sort of um, solved the because um, getting sober you feel like an alien. It's like shit. I can't go and do the things I used to do, and I'm no longer connected to my my friends in the same way I used to be connected to them. So now I'm lonely. So I've got to go find out how other people stay sober, and then that becomes your new group of friends, basically. So basically, it's a long way of saying like. Being so immersed in the comedy community now, I'm less immersed in the recovery community, and I'm less engaged in my recovery, which is not a safe thing. Um, so I'm finding I'm trying to find the balance right now because I don't want to drink, I don't want to relapse. Like I don't miss drinking. Like my life is a lot easier uh, and less dramatic and more fun, and it's just a better life. But uh, you know, my guards are down for sure. You know, like there's times where it's like, you know, a nice cold one would be good. I did, I did three mics tonight. I deserve something. You know, uh, those passing thoughts will come and go, and I recognize them as like, you know, my crazy brain talking to me. Uh, so with that said, I guess the 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 hardest thing is just like figuring out how to maintain a balance because. If I could have it my way, I'd be at the bars and clubs doing open mics or shows every single night. Um, but I gotta, I gotta pick and choose a little better uh, because I need to, I need to keep my um, recovery uh, as a priority. I'm glad. I mean, uh, I I just wonder how many um, how many sober people are just afraid of of that of just the immersion in in that you know that environment and, and how many of them stay away because they 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 don't trust their their ability to resist the temptation. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that's maybe why Pat Miscellaneous didn't work out. You know, like maybe. Maybe I wasn't ready to be playing rap concerts in bars for a while, you know? Because uh, it did take a lot of, you know, learning a lot of tools to to not want to get fucked up, you know? Uh, but with that said, it, it's not impossible, you know? Like, you can do anything sober. I mean, I, I remember starting therapy and in my very first session saying to the guy, like, I'm two weeks dry. I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but my girlfriend does. Uh, and she can go fuck herself because that's my identity. And when I drink, I'm a rock star. I'm like this bulletproof personality. Like, you know, t giving him my resume of like how cool I am when mm. I drink, you know? And he's like, dude, you can, you can, anything you do drunk, you can do sober, you know? So if the worry for someone is like, man, how could I how can I do this thing, how can I perform for people without getting wasted, uh, you know, you can, it just takes, it takes getting, getting, uh, I mean, there's, there's some, there's, there's a saying in, in the people I hang out with that say, you know, we can do, you know, you can do anything, uh, but it's contingent on your spiritual fitness. You know, if you're spiritually fit, you can do anything. And I think that's true, you know. And spiritually fit, t to me, means if you if you got your shit together, uh, you can go do whatever you want, you know. Um, do you realize now also, though, that, that in doing material about being in recovery, that now there are a number of us who... Would 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 do, are conscious of that and would would try to keep you from uh, you know you, you know what I mean like myself or Judith like would would probably not let you order a beer at a bar yeah and so, I, I mean, that's great I if anyone listening to this is ever with me at a bar and I start mm -hmm. talking about how it might be a good idea that I have a drink 
uh, feel free to <laughs> kick kick my ass for sure. All right. Um, yeah, we're at my time limit. But oh man. I just want to say um, the, the the one reason that I knew that this was going to be good is because you're so honest on stage. Um, and I think that you're just a if just because I have to um, polish your apple for a sec here. <laughs> um, I'll just say that your your honesty and also not just with the 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 sobriety and everything, which is important, but also the um, your the way that you embraced education. As a as a comic and and the need for that structure and stuff, I think it's also important that a lot of comics realize that just because you take a class, it doesn't mean that you're saying that you're not funny or that you know what I'm saying or mm -hmm. that you're that you're you're somebody else is writing your material. Yeah. Um, so I always like to use you as an example of someone who's taken Jeff's classes because I'm just like, look at Holbert, you know, he's yeah, he's got it all and he's so funny and everything like that and. Uh, yeah, oh, um, do you have any video uh, stand-up stuff online that people can check out if they want? I, or haven't, I haven't shared my videos yet, because I, I, I don't feel like my jokes about the people in my life are done yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I don't want the people in my life to see jokes I've made about them uh, before I think they're... Fully formed in yeah. whatever way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but I just want to say one thing about classes, and for if if you're like new and thinking about getting into comedy and you're scared, like just do it. Like stop, because I had the self doubt conversation for years and years and years and years, and like it's such a waste of energy and time. Just like go take a class and do it. And for established comedians, I think maybe they want to check out a class. Like I think I'm a pretty smart guy like I'll make jokes about how I'm kind of a dumb guy but like I, I and I and I appreciate you calling me humble before but I have a pretty high opinion of myself which is dangerous because I can tend to think I know everything and I think the second I think I know everything and I've got this figured out like that's just gonna hold me back you know and I think taking classes is a good way of admitting like I don't know everything and maybe the universe knows stuff that I don't know and it will communicate them to me through other people you know mm. and that's that's my thing it's like why not open more doors to the universe by taking classes or finding a writing partner or whatever you know I mean I, I don't want other people to write jokes for me but of course not I want other people to help me write my you know help me well that's that's the point is like that I tell people though is that like Patrick took the six week class and you know with Jeff Lawrence and none of his jokes are about being a gay right. Jewish Brooklyn Nets fan right. you know they're all about being Patrick Holbert and I think yeah. that's important for because it, that was a misconception that I had about education uh, as far as stand up work you know yeah. I kind of knew improv was going to be one thing but I was a little bit you know and I was like oh okay so I w sort of wish I had taken it but um, oh what's your Twitter real quick Oh, my Twitter is the Holbert Report. Uh, <laughs> it looks like the Colbert Report. My last name is pronounced Holbert, uh, but I figured I'd ride as many coattails as possible. Um, but there are too many letters, so there's no T on the end of Holbert. So it's just the. I think you could Google it. Okay. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks a lot, dude. And, uh, thank yeah, you, everybody. You know, thanks for listening. What more can I say, guys? It was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening. You can check me out on Twitter, Josh Paladini, J O S H P A L A D I N I. On YouTube is Muggies247, M U G G I E S 247. Thanks again for listening. Stay tuned for the next one. Love you. Bye.